next up we have Jess Clark. Um, currently, <laughs> woohoo! Currently, Jess leads uh, the design systems teams at LinkedIn. Uh, she's responsible for enabling quality design at scale through Art Deco. This is how their design system is called. Um, Jess, welcome. <laughs> I'm going to still introduce you for a little bit, but <laughs> welcome. Uh, and Jess has been with LinkedIn for over eight years, so she has a lot to tell you about. Uh, she has been working on a variety of different projects, and today she's going to discuss about elevating the experience of your design system. And to keep it consistent, we're going to ask her the first question. What was your first uh, design job ever? My first design job was at LinkedIn, so it's pretty boring. Um, I actually, <laughs> I was uh, I actually started at LinkedIn as the front desk receptionist, and then became the first design intern um, that they had because at the time I was going to design school in like 2010 when like there was no jobs anywhere. I was you know applying everywhere, and um, the VP of design at the time came by the desk and um, sort of said like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm trying to design." He's like, "Why don't you be a design intern?" I'm like, you, "We don't have those here. We just have like a hundred engineering interns." And he's like, "Why don't you do be the first one?" So I was like, "Sure, let's do it." Um, and so I really got thrown into the deep end because I came in with like a, a Mark, Marcom background. I don't know if, is anyone here from like a Marcom background, like marketing design? Sweet, you can get into design systems, it's awesome. Um, going through the brand route, totally applicable. Um, but I got thrown in and learned a lot about engineering along the way. So that was my first design. My first job job was like putting CDs in like a video game company thing where it's like assembly line where you put in the CD and you snap the thing shut and put it in a box um, back when like CDs were a thing. So. That was my first um, other job. So um, I'm Jess. You could find me at Hello Jess Clark, like uh, other people's Twitter handles, but I've tweeted one time in uh, 2015 on April Fool's Day. So um, it said, hello, Twitter, hashtag late adopter. So um, I, even though I am in tech, I am not like very techy when it comes to like social media and stuff, and I work at LinkedIn. It's pretty funny, but um, that's me. And today I'm gonna be talking about elevating the experience of your design system. So, uh, what does that really mean? We're talking about mature design systems today, um, as I mentioned, um, and mature design systems are moving from this catalog of parts to an experience. So, we talked about how everyone knows we need to build the bits, um, build the atoms, build the components. Um, are there other ways to do that? It's super interesting, so I think we should totally um, dive in on that. Um, but more than that, as you've heard from the talks already, it's about the experience of your design system. Uh, design systems today, I don't know if any of you have had this happen, if you're on one. At first, we were like, we're building the parts, and then they're like, who owns accessibility? And they're like, you do. I'm like, oh, we do. Um, who owns like rebrands or something like dark mode? Um, you do. And so I think now we're realizing that not only are we um, at the beginning of a stage of a designer's workflow, we're a part of every piece um, that they work on. So today I'm going to share the biggest challenge that we've had um, and three solutions on how we've started to bridge that gap. Uh, a little bit about who we are so that you know. I think it helps for some context. We have 25 people working on our system. Um, about 10 of those um, are on the design side and the rest are engineering. Uh, we have some Hercules engineers, we have one iOS and one Android, um, and then a few web. Um, we're on our third generation of our system. We are at web, iOS, and Android code. Uh, we actually launched our iOS and Android libraries last year, so they're still really new. Um, so we're kind of in the position there where we have the libraries done, but all the apps were built before the libraries were done, and so we're going through that process um, right now. Uh, we have 200 people in our user experience org, so I don't know what that makes my ratio, like 10 to 20, if I can do the math right, for design. Um, we have about 1,000 engineers, too many product managers to count, and um, 100 different products at LinkedIn. I know most of you probably engage with the one, like the app and the, the website, but we have tons for marketing, sales, and um, uh, other types of talent, um, different enterprise groups. So back to what we were talking about. Um, we're talking about the, the product design workflow. So the product design workflow, design systems, at first we're starting, hey, here's some parts, use this thing. But really, now we are a part of almost every piece of the flow that they're working through. So I'm gonna talk about today, how do you um, elevate your system? Um, because the workflow is super critical, and how do you play a role in each of those pieces? Um, so I thought about a couple of challenges to how we actually elevate ourselves to make sure that we're paying attention to the workflow for, for our designers. Um, but they all kind of rolled up into one. So I have one and three solutions. Um, it's really how to lead and serve. And there's three parts of this. 
The first part is how. Uh, we kind of have the, the what part of things. We know what we're doing, but how we do it is super important. The tone you use, uh, when you're when you're guiding people, the guidance that you write, the tools that you build, the components you build, how you collaborate. We talked. We learned a lot about different processes, um, which were super awesome ways of how to collaborate with the rest of your design or engineering team, so that they can really play a critical role um, in the system. Um, the how is super important here, and then lead and serve. So we've kind of been on the pendulum of this. At first, when we created our system, we were all about the lead. Like, we are at the forefront. We are creating the components. Uh, we, are gonna, we are gonna bring the brand to all of the products. Um, use this blue. Don't ask questions. Just listen to what we say. It matters. Um, and that didn't really work. I don't know if any of you have tried that, of just throw it over the fence and hope everyone uses it. Um, but then actually, we ended up in this place based on feedback where we ended up all the way on the other side, where we were like, it's cool, you can use, what we have blues, they're, they're there for you if you wanna use them, use whatever blue you want. People would ask us questions, like, is this the right one? And we would not be clear at all. We were like, could be the right one, it depends on what you think, is it the right one? Um, it's it, like, you know, build your own life. So we, we, we realized after a while, after we grew, I love to talk about like how you have to change based on how big your team is. Someone else mentioned that too. Is it even right for your team? Totally assess that. So here we were like, we're all lead, and then we're like, everybody build your own life. And now we're trying to find um, somewhere in the middle. So how do we do that? The first one is build bridges, not dams. So what would be a dam in this situation? Has anyone here tried to like stop every A-B test or like design to go out that isn't on the system? Anyone try that? Because we totally tried that. It was like, nobody gets to launch except through us. Like we are the people who are going to decide whether this is worthy. Um, it did not work because unlike the real world, when you build a dam in the design systems world, people just like flow around you. They don't care you're there. They're just like, we're not gonna like come to that review meeting where you're gonna tell us what to do and what not to do and not listen to us. Um, so really this is about like not building dams but building bridges. Take people along with you. Bring them across. A lot of times in this world, like you guys are here right now, we get to learn about things before the rest of our org. It's a pretty cool place to be in. Like we know accessibility is important before anyone else in our company. And so we tell people accessibility is important. And then we get super frustrated with the fact that they're like not bought in right away. And we forget that like we went on this journey with everyone else in our like design system industry to learn about it. Um, and then we kind of just throw them into it and hope that they like understand the importance of it and have buy-in. So this is really about bringing people along with you in the journey and then realizing that when they start their journey, a lot of times it's after you've already come to a conclusion. So what are a few ways that we ensure that we're building bridges and not dams? Um, one of them is um, a quarterly survey. So we started sending out this survey um, to all of our designers and we also have a separate one for our engineers as well to gain insight at scale um, on the usability and quality of our work. And it's not just like, is the component good? Because we're, we're in a pretty good place with that. It's like, are components working? What do you want to contribute? What do you not want to do? Um, a lot of this is about like, can you use it? Someone mentioned that before. Like, can you find the stuff? Is our documentation good? Is our collaboration good? Are our programs good? Are you able to work with us? Are we easy to work with or are we difficult? And having this survey allows people and gives people a space where they can give you that feedback. Um, and then you can look at it quarter over quarter. So someone talked about metrics too. This really helps. Um, I don't know if people have heard like NPS and things like that. It's a little bit like doing that for um, our internal org so that we know if we're succeeding or not. The next one was a request form. Um, we launched this only like two quarters ago um, and it was huge for us. It really helped us solve the right problem and make data driven decisions. Before this, um, it was a lot of like, whoever got to like catch us in the hallway and tell us what they wanted to do. We're like, sure, we'll do that. And that's what we did first. We were able to really look across and say, hey, what, is there commonality here? Um, I love the tool tips and bottom sheets. Woo, I don't know. Has anyone else had like the tool tip problem? Please like, okay, and everybody else's team be like, where's my bottom sheet? Everybody else has a bottom sheet. I want a bottom sheet. Those are also our like top two things that we're working on right now. 
Um, so this really helps us find that. You know, we get like five requests from bottom sheet, and they can. We, it also helps them think through the process. So we have some questions in there um, that helps them think through, like internationalization. Um, you know, localizing it, accessibility, um, finding finding places in all of the existing um, processes that you have to educate. Um, because, like I said, they're going to be a little bit behind a lot of times. So we need to bring them along that journey. Um, Doc CMS. So this one particularly is from Zero Height, um, which is a company who's like building CMSs for design systems, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and this this one's really about share your platforms and build things together. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, before uh, here's like something that that we did, which wasn't a good solve at our scale. We thought we're going to build documentation like Google. It's going to be great. We're going to build it out of our own system, and it's going to be so cool. People are going to love it. So we built our own documentation with our like t small team, um, built it as an MP. So we like had to get ship it. It went through our code base. If we like bumped stuff, we had to bump it. Um, and then we found that like even though we were maintaining the product of our documentation, we weren't like writing the documentation. So like all of the documentation was three years old and nobody used it or read it. We just like felt good about shipping a product. Um, and so this is like where we weren't solving the right problem and also um, we weren't able to let other people onto it because we were writing it in HTML. And so like it wasn't um, super approachable for other designers to jump in and help us write documentation. So we had like a gate of like one or two people who could fill it out. Um, so it was not practical. And I think we had this like weird thing where we're like, we don't want other people to like write documentation with us because like what if it's not good? We are the quality. We are the quality bar, um, and I think it's a little ironic because like I think we, people have mentioned that our documentation like isn't that good, and we're worried about other people writing bad documentation. Um, I think it's hey like when we work together and we share our platform and we build things together, it's going to be better. There's going to be like sticky points, and we might not agree with everything, um, but like holding the gate and not sharing our platform um, isn't the right solution, and we don't end up in the best place. Um, so this quote from um, Daniel really resonates with me. Um, People is our job, and he mentions basically ultimately, no matter what tools we have. Um, no matter what development tools or design tools, what changes in the industry, whether we're now responsible for accessibility or theming or all these different things, um, our job as design systems really is making better bridges between the people involved in building something. So let's not, not, not lose sight of um, why we're here, and let's make sure to bring people along and build those bridges um, as we build. So the next one, tools, not rules. Um, I think this is a pretty like popular phrase, but this comes to you from the hallways of LinkedIn with my peer Andrew, who like said it in passing, and I thought, that's genius. I didn't think of that, um, and I haven't really heard that. So um, I think this is awesome because um, you know governance is tricky for a lot of different reasons, for the human reasons, and for the scale. Like your team, your your product team and your engineering team is going to grow way faster than your systems team. I think we've all seen that um, horizontal teams take time to build. And so as those things scale, it's going to be impossible to um, you know, ensure that your system is working um, and that people are using it. Also, like, there's not a lot of like, designers or developers who like, want their main job to be telling other people what to do. There might be some. Some of you might work with them. But not a lot of people. Um, and then there's not a lot of designers and developers who want to be like told what to do. Um, so I think this, this, um, the tooling idea can really be um, relevant in helping us even build those bridges and make sure that um, governance can happen while we still like you know keep our humanity. So, um, in general, tools are kind of like robots, and robots are the future. So, let robots do some of your job. It's awesome. So we're going to talk about some of the tools that we um, built. You talked about um, plugins and how like. Um, you can do that with small teams. Um, working with contractors can be a cool way of doing that because if you if you know what you want to do, um, it's and you have a designer or someone that can kind of help bring them along. Um, someone can create that uh, create a tool, especially if you have a specific need and just need it. Um, just need one thing. So this is really cool. Our team helped partner um, with someone on this to create a spec plugin. So basically, this is kind of the tools not rules idea of we were telling everyone you need to create consistent annotations on your specs and not use a tool that like automatically, even though they're cool, Figma, um, not use a tool that automatically um, like annotates for you because it wouldn't, like a lot of the tools out there wouldn't highlight the name of our component and like that game, 
Like, people didn't know how to find the component, especially if an engineer got something. They didn't know how to look it up, and it was a lot of friction. So they needed to just know the names. They didn't have to think about it. They didn't have to even go to documentation. They could just type it in, and they could find it. Um, so we built a plugin to kind of bridge um, the, the gap for um, Sketch here to make sure that we have um, the component so they can find it. Like, hey, this is this kind of button, um, and it can reference our library that we have. Um, and it also helps the designers like follow through to the end code product. We recently launched this like a couple of months ago. One thing that was really interesting learning, you're always learning in this field, is that we have item spacing. It's pretty basic spacing that's consistent with a name. Um, our designers started using this, started like annotating. It was awesome. And then we started getting a flood of things in our Slack channel of like, my engineer has no idea what item spacing is. What is that? Um, and we're like, wait. This is pretty basic. People have missed this. Um, so I think building tools also can help you find your gaps that you have um, in education and making sure that people know what's out there. Um, translation plugin. Um, this one's super cool. This is another thing where we, you know, we were advocating for making sure that your design considers different locales um, and making sure that you can content proof your design solution. Um, but we were advocating that, telling everyone, bring all your mocks to the design reviews in like three different languages. And like, I guess people were supposed to go to like Google Translate or something and figure it out. Um, and so that's one of the things again where we look back and we're like, we're just like causing friction by telling people they have to do this without helping them do it. And so um, one of the designers on our team actually um, ended up, uh, Nate Whitson, I have the names down here, you can see too, um, actually ended up building this himself because he was like so frustrated and he's like, I want to help the workflow. This is really important. Um, so he like learned how to build plugins for Sketch and built this. Tab order stickers. Um, this is something that actually um, Microsoft, which you know is our daddy company now, um, they kind of came out with this, and, and we um, took it from them of like helping designers spec for accessibility. I think we're kind of in the place now where we're helping designers know that it's important to design inclusively and you know design for accessibility. Think about tab order and that sort of thing. But then, how do they spec for that consistently, and how do engineers? read those specs and know what to do. We found this really weird space where like everyone's like, yeah, tab order is important, but it's like, who's supposed to pick the tab order? Is it the engineer or is it the designer? And how do they do this? So we created these stickers for designers so that they can help um, first do a pass of annotation, um, and then they can sit down with their engineer and talk about whether that makes sense um, with the way it's built. And then um, generic data. Um, so this one's really interesting. And I think the benefit of here is that you can protect member privacy, but also represent your diverse user base. So what we were seeing was our designers were coming through, and every single one of their mocks had companies like that you probably all work at, um, like tech companies. And everyone was like an engineer designer. And we're like, you know, this doesn't actually represent our product. Like our product has like so many industries, so many people from tons of different countries. So we actually um, made all of our components with like generated data so that um, um, people are kind of like, uh, like Nate would say, they fall into the pit of success. Um, they fall into the pit of success of being able to not have member data or like screenshots. I love that comment because that happens. Screenshots in their design of like real member stuff um, or um, not having a diverse user base. So being able to represent that was really cool. Um, and I love this um, quote from Mina Markham. She um, created Pantsuit, which is like so awesome, um, Hillary Clinton's UI Pattern Library. Um, and she talks about, like, my job is to make sure the system is modular and flexible enough to be used in a number of unpredictable ways. Um, I really like, like how she just she gets it and she articulated it so well that service is our job. Um, you know, we can't lose sight of why we're here. Ultimately, our team exists to empower the product teams to build um, their products, right? And so I think this quote probably like scares some of you because like used in a number of unpredictable ways um, is like really scary. Um, but that's the truth. Like we build the system and we collect insight from them and we continue to iterate on it, but we're not gonna predict the future and we're not gonna predict how they use it and we need to flex um, and build tools so that they can be successful. Solution three, strong opinions weekly held. So. You've built bridges, you've built tools, and now a designer or an engineer wants to change something you've done. And the thing you've done is so great. Why would they want to change it? So this is where um, I really think it's about your posture and how we're communicating and collaborating with the designers and engineers in our org. 
we have to be strong and have an opinion and really advocate for things like accessibility, um, localization, um, all of the things that, that we know um, and are a little bit more um, privy to because of our industry of being ahead of the times. But we have to be willing to be challenged, to change um, our perspective um, be based on member research, um, our users, which are our product designers and engineers, um, you know, they're out there creating the work with the things that we build. So we have to make sure that we can ebb and flow um, when they give us feedback. Um, so like I mentioned before, we've kind of been on the, the swing of this and figuring out like how do we lead and like help them understand what we know because it's important and then how do we like serve them because our job is about people and our job is about being a service because we're here to empower them. Um, and this is really the solution we came up with. Like we lead strong but it, the, our opinions are weakly held. We're willing to be changed and we're willing to change our mind and to work with them to move forward. Um, so this is, you know, easier said than done, um, but building empathy with your product designers and your engineers is really important. So a couple of ways that we um, do this, we have a design approach, which um, our uh, DPM team worked on and our core team, which is like, we kind of came up with this new framework of how we approach design. And one thing that we realized was a lot of people were coming to us at the end of the design approach. So they were like, hey, I already came up with my idea. I already solved my problem. I, I'm just ready to launch this thing. And actually, my engineers are waiting for this exact component to put in right now today. And we're like, we haven't started it because like no one told us. Um, and so this is one thing where it's like moving collaboration to the left um, so that we can co-own solutions. And this really helps that feedback loop. Like not only does it, does it help them give you feedback so your, um, your components are better, um, but it also allows them to have co-ownership of the thing. I love that model of like um, rotating in. That is so cool because they will evangelize the thing. When they help you create the component from the beginning of the process and you work through the problem um, and, and the solution together, they will own it. And they will also um, you know, back it up when they're in rooms with um, different um, cross-functional partners and have to push for the solution as well. Workshops. Um, this is also a, a cool way of doing it. We actually have like a, an illustration workshop coming up like this Friday. This one was for um, component extensions. So really empowering teams to identify and contribute patterns. Like you have to create the space for them so that they feel empowered to contribute back. So in this way, um, I think talking about like the whole atomic thing, I think one big question for us is like, when do you stop? Like how big do these things get where it's still centralized? Or like I mentioned, we have tons of product teams. So like a whole talent solution, a whole sales solution, like when they create stuff from our stuff, do they share that stuff or do they just keep that stuff? So that's what we're working through right now. And I think like holding workshops to empower them to understand what systems thinking is and how they can build upon what you've already done is awesome. Because even if they build bigger things that aren't shared across teams, they can still build that library for themselves and have that consistency. And then office hours, um, I think honestly from everything that we've learned, one-on-one -on -one time and being in person or like VC in person, but just you know, um, being with each other um, makes a huge difference. Building that mutual understanding, working through problem and solution together, like build empathy for what they're going through. Um, I think it was mentioned before how they're like heads down solving their problem, um, like the tooltip thing. And so they can't take a step back, but you're there to take a step back. And so it's valuing each other's perspective and making sure that you understand where they're coming from. You build empathy um, for them. And they're also building empathy from you. I think that co-ownership thing also builds tons of empathy. Like when they have to work through what the system is like and how to uphold it, they also understand where you're coming from. And building that mutual understanding is really the only way forward to realize um, you know, the work that we want to do, which is empowering these teams um, to create great things. So I want to leave you with this quote from um, Oprah. It's actually from um, Jeff, our CEO, like interviewed her a few times on LinkedIn Learning. Um, so I totally recommend going to see it. Um, this is with acting with intention. She talks about how everyone wants to be heard and recognized, like everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. She gives all these examples from like an inmate that she interviewed all the way to like Beyonce. And she's like, Beyonce after a concert wants to know how she did. Inmate after an interview wants to know how he did. Like everybody wants to be heard. And so I think this is a really important thing of like, she, she talks about how every argument or every like um, piece of time that you're having friction with other teams, it can almost be boiled down to this. Like, are you really listening to them? 
And are you hearing them? And are you letting them know that they're they're heard and that you value their input? Um, and so I just want to leave with this um, quote because it's it's I think it's really big deal and it's like a lot of what we do when people is our job and we're here to empower them and we're here to service them. We have to listen to them and make sure that we're bringing them along for the journey. So. Elevating the experience of your design system, um, the experience and the workflow is super critical to what you do. It's not just about the parts anymore, it's about them taking the parts, using it, contributing to it, shipping it, giving feedback on it, working with you every day. Um, so build bridges, not dams. Um, don't be difficult to work with, be a friend. Um, build tools, not rules, let the robots do the work. Um, and uh, have strong opinions, but weekly held and be willing to change. Thank you.